As a founding member of the most successful girl group of all times, the Supremes, she recorded a dozen number one songs. From Where Did Our Love Go to Stop in the Name of Love to You Can't Hurry Love, they defined a generation. Eventually, Diana Ross left the group, but they continued on, continuing to record and chart singles throughout the 70s. Her career followed, including the publication of her best-selling autobiography, Dream Girl, My Life is a Supreme. Hello, I'm Ernie Manus. Coming up on interviews, our conversation with Rock and Roll Hall of Fame member, Mary Wilson. So does it feel like it's been as many years as it has? I think to myself, when the Supremes were, to you, does it still feel within reach, or does it feel like a story you remember? <laughs> I remember I asked my mother that once, you know, Mom, how does it feel? She was like in her 70s. I mean, how, how old do you feel? She says, I feel like I'm 15. <laughs> and so for me, now I understand that I still feel like I'm like 15 years old inside. Yeah. But, you know, the time has gone by. It's been 50 years since our first number one. Yeah. But it's been 55 years since we first started singing. And I swear to you, it doesn't seem like it's been yeah, that I'm many sure years. I'm sure audience, when you say that, are like, oh, yeah. it's been that long? Because it seems so yeah. within reach. It does, it does. Uh, you, know, I, you know, it took me the longest time to become 21. <laughs> and after that, it just started. <laughs> Blue, you know. <laughs> well, a lot of people don't realize how young you were when you started. Yes, yes. You started at 12 years old, you said? Uh, Diana and I, I think we were 12 and a half. I think Flo was 13. And then we had a fourth member, you know, right. uh, Betty McGlon. And she was older. She was 17. <laughs> <laughs> She's the old one She's in the group. She's the old one in the group, yeah. So, yeah, we were very young. When you were that young and all of this starts happening, do you realize what it is you're desiring, or is it just, we're kids, we love singing, we want to be successful? Well, see, that's a different, the story is very difficult to answer in that way, because when we were little girls, we were still just Negroes. Negroes during that time did not aspire to be stars and things like that. We were just trying to live and, and become part of the American system, you yeah. know. So uh, for us uh, at that age, we were just having fun, yeah. just doing something to have fun. Later, you know, after we went and auditioned for Motown, we were accepted, and this was like, uh, by then we were 16, uh, 1961. At that point, you know, we said, wow, this is really cool, yeah. and uh, started thinking of just, you know, doing more than, than it just being a, a hobby. And uh, once we graduated from high school, I remember telling Eddie Holland, I said, you know, we really want a hit because if we don't get a hit, <laughs> our parents are going to send us to college. <laughs> so, you know, so then, we, then it became something of the fact that, well, maybe this could be, you know, a career. Because your mom wanted you to go to college. And you oh. were like, no, I want to go sing. My mother, no, I never said it like that. No. My mother, you know, was from the the old school where a lot of blacks were not required to go to school. Mm -hmm. So she could not read and write. So her biggest uh, desire was to see one of her children or all of her children go to college. Yeah. So that's why it was a big deal, you know. But education was so important uh, to to Afro-American families because it meant you, were, you could move ahead. Right. And so, yeah. And, I, you know, once I got hooked, I was hooked. You there know. was no turning back. I, I didn't want to do anything else but that. Because I remember as a child, I wanted to be a ballerina. Uh, and, uh, you know, that kind of, I never, we couldn't afford dance classes, you know, so that didn't materialize. So how did you know you could sing? I mean, a lot of I kids I never knew once, I could sing. You never I knew? No, I never knew I could sing. But I was always, I mean, since kindergarten, I was always in a glee club, uh, an ensemble, or da 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 I never knew I could I thought everybody wake, woke up in the morning singing, you know, like Doris Day. Yeah. <laughs> you said, open the refrigerator, ah! yeah. <laughs> uh, I thought everyone did that. You know, yeah. it was just something that um, I just did naturally, but I never thought I could sing. Yeah. And I was always around these wonderful people. I remember uh, Aretha Franklin, and uh, uh, her sister Carolyn were, Carolyn and I went to the same school. And so th they could sing, you know, I mean, they were singers. I, I never thought that I was anything like that. 
when you talk about the time in which all of this was going on in the early 60s and then something like Motown comes along mm -hmm. at the moment did you realize wow this could be something different this could mean something to us or was it just we enjoy singing this is an opportunity to sing for someone professional um, you know as I said earlier it was one of those things where we were doing this because it was fun and yeah. and, and we, when I met Florence Diane and Betty I just it was at that moment, 13 years old, that I really realized this was very special and that these people kind of represented who I, who I was. And that's when I realized it was definitely something special, but still not knowing that it could be a career, a right. lifelong career. Had no clue about <laughs> that, you know. But as time went on and, you know, being at Motown and meeting People like Stevie Wonder, whom I adore, you know, the Four Tops, the Temptations, Marvin Gaye, and all these people. Then you start realizing, wow, we're in line, you know, with all of that. Yeah, this is different. It's, yeah. it, it's really something special. Is there a point when you remember that you knew you had made it? Was oh, there, yes. What yes, was that yes. The time when we were, when we were on um, the Dick Clark Caravan of Stars. And I've got, you, I try to make this story short, but <laughs> I tell long stories. You know, I write books, yeah. right? <laughs> so, but anyway, so um, we're now, I forgot how old we were, 18 maybe, and uh, we had we had recorded about eight or nine records, and then Barry Gordy put us with Holland Dosha Holland, and they came up with, with this record, Where Did Our Love Go? So Dick Clark's people called Motown and said, we want to have Brenda Holloway uh, on the show. And they said, oh, you're okay, you can have Brenda, but you got to take the Supremes. And so Dick Clark is like, well, who are the Supremes? Because we, we were not you know, yeah. famous at all. We just had some local records in Detroit. And I, he said, uh, he says, no, I just want Brenda. He says, you, you got to have, if you can have Brenda, but you got to take the Supremes. They got a big record coming out and they're <laughs> going to be big. So Dick took us anyway. And uh, it, it was amazing because the third week, I think we wanted to, or something like that, the record where our logo broke and it oh, became wow. a smash. And that's when we knew we had made it because we flew home. Prior to that, we were called the No Hit Supremes. Right, because you've been with the label for a few years and a nothing had time. really connected yet. Right, right. And which was fine in the beginning because, you know, we had no aspirations about anything else, so it was fine. But then once we realized this really could go someplace else, uh, that was when, you know, we said, okay, we got we to gotta get that hit record. Yeah. Once you have the hit record, how do things start to change? Oh, our whole life's changed. I mean, you know, uh, Motown took us to Europe, and it was like the Mo Motown's Supremes. That's where yeah. we were built, you know, and we started traveling internationally. internationally, And, uh, you know, this was during the time of the Civil Rights Bill and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So now we are like one of the faces of black America to the world. Yeah. Um, people were looking up to us. I mean, and you, you, guys, you, tell, you guys accepted the Beatles here, and that's yeah. the way we were accepted in, in Europe. Do you realize, though, at the time, what a big civil rights statement you're making? Oh, sure. You know? I, mean, if, if, I mean, you have to understand, if you're, it's very difficult to, to explain. If you're a black person who has no credibility, no, I mean, you, people were being hung, they were being killed, all this stuff, and your parents are telling you, when you walk out of here, you know, you put on your best face, you put on your best manager, because you, the man, uh, manners, you don't know what's going to happen to you, right. you know. So if you now, all of a sudden, people are looking up to you, gosh, of course you know. Yeah. You know, I mean, the whole, everything changed. Did you find during that time there were still places you went where it didn't change? Where people oh, it still is, <laughs> <I'm> still <laughs> you know. But no, you know, on the Dick Clark tour, we were on with uh, Gene Pitney, Sherelle, Drift, uh, Drifters, Jan and Dean, Leslie Go. I mean, just uh, uh, yeah. Lou Christie, all these people, all these great stars. A caravan of stars. Yeah, you know, why it was, you know. But it was an integrated one. Yeah. So we were touring the South and all these places, and sometimes we could not stay in the same hotel. And I remember, I remember Dick. I love Dick for this. He would say, if you cannot accept all of us, if you don't accept all of us, none of us stay. And he'd say, everybody get back on the bus, and then we go to someplace else. Wow. Now, at the same time, your brother, is he active in the Black Panthers? 
at that uh, time? Well, he was, you know, one of those. <laughs> yeah. And, but I, I don't know if he was signed up, but he was definitely one. The reason I bring that up <laughs> is that both of you are working to change the way the world sees your mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. and the different impacts it has and how you folks doing what you did mm -hmm. just move things along I think in a way a lot of people wouldn't realize how much yes. you were doing for civil rights yes. just by being performers of who you well were. you know I do this show the Lena Horne show that, um, and, and, and in it um, you know there's a line that I say that she said which was um, you know, the black people were talking against me, the white people were causing, you know. And her thing was like, because she was so beautiful, black people didn't think that she still had the, that she had the right to say these kind of things because she was glamorous, she was had a big career, but things were happening to her that she couldn't do. So she was doing her part that way. Then there were other people who were actually literally marching. Right. And so the same thing with us, you know, when my brother says, Mary, why don't you wear an afro? And I'm like, no, I don't think so, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, but later on, I did, of course. Right. But but at the time, it's like we're doing what we do the way we're doing, and we think right. we're making a difference this way. And there are other people who do it another way. But it's all working towards the same. End. And you ended up the most successful girl group of all time. Not yeah, but I don't like to say that in front of my other girlfriends. You know, oh, yeah. like the Pointer <laughs> Sisters and the people I love, the Shirelles. You know. And we love them all, too. But a fact is a fact. You people broke so many barriers, did so much with your career. Then, of course, there comes a time where things are shifting within the group. Mm -hmm. And Diana Ross gets moved into the forefront for a bit. Mm -hmm. And then she leaves the group. Mm -hmm. For you, and I know you've written about it a lot, but, and I don't want to spend a lot of time <laughs> on it, but I'm curious, where are you coming from? How are you feeling during this period? And is there ever a moment during all of that where you think, maybe our time is done? Did you ever feel that way? Uh, I guess if you knew me, and, and a lot of people really don't know me, they think they do, I've never had that kind of thought. Yeah. I just, I, I do uh, know that there was a time uh, when we became so very, very big that other elements were coming in and it changed the dynamics of our group. It changed the f relationships, you know, and that kind of happens uh, when money comes into play and right. big business comes into play. but. Personally, I love, I love doing yeah. what I do, and I never once thought of giving up. I, I, I did, uh, when Florence left, I did realize that, wow, I got to decide how I can stay where I am, you know? And then when Diane left, I had to decide, well, what am I going to do? How am I going to do it? My thing is how. Yeah. Um, and so, no, I never really thought of giving up at any point, but I just needed to learn, I knew I need to learn how to do my craft better. Yeah. I mean, I, I had, you know, stopped really virtually singing uh, once we started recording and just did the oohs and ahs and baby, baby, babies, which I said I do the best oohs and ahs and baby, baby, babies. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when Flo and Diane left, I had to really start, really start honing, honing my, my talents yeah. and learning if I had it. I, I did question, well, do I have it, what it takes to be out there on my own. I said, well, I got to because I'm not going to stop. Yeah. So that's always been my mindset on it. So I think I that's the wonderful thing that, up. that comes out of your story is the belief in oneself and the belief to keep going because so often people are met with obstacles that stop or get in their way and it becomes harder. And not only were changes made within the group, there was a conscious effort to kind of quiet down the Supremes. Mm. And what a lot of people don't remember probably today is the Supremes went on and had more hits after Diana Ross had left. That it wasn't just that you went on with the group. You guys continued to record and have hits. One friend was bringing up the point that Stone Love is, was rated number eight in one of the polls and as, as, as one of the all-time great songs. I love, I, like I love it all. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of like in the middle because I love, you know, the 60s, I love the 70s, but my heart and soul is with the 60s yeah. because it's, because it wasn't about the hits. Mm -hmm. It was about daring to dream. Yeah. It was about people coming together and realizing a, a dream and going together towards that dream. So for me, that's the story. 
uh, everything else, you know, for me also was just kind of holding on to to that. Then after a while, you it's like a, a boxer or a lot of other people. You got to learn when to get out of the ring, you yeah. know, uh, or a captain of a ship. You got to know when you got to get out of otherwise you're going down too. <laughs> so it, it's a it's a it's not an easy thing to for me to do. I've had to balance my love between uh, you know the original and and everything that came after, mm -hmm. uh, and it's okay. I do that. But yeah. my heart and soul is definitely with the '60s because that was the that was the dream. That was the being young people daring to achieve something, which we we achieved it, and the whole world is looking at it. So everything else is kind of like holding that dream and continuing on. And we did have great hits in the '70s. I mean, yeah. Gene Terrell is one of the greatest singers in the world, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Sherry, fabulous singer. Uh, Linda, Suze, I mean, all great, but. But the dream wasn't there. Now, you know, it was uh, something else. It was something else, which is, you know, not good, not bad, just something else. When you first hear about the musical Dreamgirls, mm. rightly or wrongly, a lot of people assume it's your story yes, up there. Yes, yes. What was your reaction? Well, see, if I say that now, then, well, that's okay. I can say it now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please feel free to say anything. Well, on, I'll put it this way. On stage, I say, I know you guys think that the, the, the play and the movie Dreamgirls is about the Supremes. Well, it's not. Yeah. And I know because I didn't get paid. <laughs> so, but uh, <laughs> I did find a way to get paid, which I, when I wrote my book, and I entitled it Dream Girl, My Life is a Supreme, uh, every time anyone buys it, then I get paid. Right. So. <laughs> See, I'm smarter than most people think. <laughs> but uh, it's, even though they stumbled upon the truth in, in a very creative way that I don't think they even realized it. I mean, yeah. it's so ch close to, to our story, which is really amazing. True, they did take a lot of our history and the legacies and these and that, but still the storyline, and I've spoken to Shirley Ralph, I mean, she and I are very dear friends, you know, and I know they had a workshop, so they went in there and they kind of worked things out their own way, which had mm -hmm. nothing to do with us, and it still ended up being like kind of our, our story. Um, but it's it, it's not it's mm -hmm. not and and it's great it's a great uh, art form I'm very proud of it but it kind of took something away from the actual supreme story because now we can't tell a supreme story because right. everyone, everyone believes thinks that's the story that's the story yeah. and it's so close to it the one beautiful part in it that I absolutely adore and I do I am changing in the show is that the, the Jennifer Hudson part is so much like. Florence's story. Mm -hmm. it, it's so much like Florence's story that it really could have been Florence's story. Yeah. And the sad part is that she was, she's not alive to, to see it, you know, to feel it or whatever. Um, yeah. But it got an Academy Award. It, <laughs> as you mentioned, it led you to writing your book, Dream Girl. No, no, I, I kept a diary all my life. But to put it out. At that. No, 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 no. We're gonna do nothing. Now? No, no. I, I, I started writing a diary when I went to Motown at the age of seventeen. And uh, my teacher at the time, before I graduated, said, Mira, you should become a writer and stop going down to that Motown and stop singing. <laughs> you should be an author. You should be a writer. And so for some reason, I started keeping a diary, knowing that one day I would put it out some form or another. Yeah. Uh, and when I, after Flo and Diane both left, I realized it was time for me to, to, to now put it into form. And that's when I started. Now, what came about from the play uh, was that the name Dream Girls it was right. something I'm go I went to see the play and I'm like, well, heck, I need a title for my book because I finished the book. Maybe I could just steal their name. They stole our story. Yeah. <laughs> so that's how that happened, and I did. I just yeah. used, you know, used it. And no, I mean, you know, someone said, well, don't you think they're gonna sue you? What I'm like, well, I don't <laughs> think so. You know, I'm not suing them. Right. And so, true enough, their lawyers did call me, but. When you sat down to actually put the book together and to take mm -hmm, your notes, mm -hmm, and you're, mm -hmm. now you're watching your life in, in, at a different point, looking mm -hmm, back at these stories, mm -hmm. did you glean different things from them? Did you see something different in the way things played out? Did anything mm -hmm. surprise you? And maybe you thought one way and something went a different. Uh, well, maybe now I, I see it, uh, you, the way you're speaking about it. But at the time, I was just telling the story as I, as I had lived it. Yeah. Because as I said, I, I kept a diary. So, I mean, I had vivid recollections of everything because it was right there. What color the wallpaper was, you know, what the airlines was, I, everything was right there. Um, and, and having written it, it was really engraved in me what it was. So I wanted to tell that story. I didn't want to color it. I didn't want to, 
you know, add things. I wanted to just tell the story. And the problem with that is that people took it and they took it from the way they would perceive it. And they said, well, she must hate that real certain person because they did that. <laughs> well, it's not true. Yeah. It's just that that happened, but it doesn't mean you hate because someone stepped on your toe. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, so I didn't, I didn't put, I try not to put my emotions in it. I try to really take emotions away and just tell the story of what happened. Yeah. Surprised at what a huge hit it was. I mean, it was a phenomenal. I wasn't. Mess up. You were no, because I was living the story. But did you know people would want to read? Did you know it would be so big? Well, let me let me let me say what this. No, of course I didn't know it would be so big. But the thing is, I knew my life is exciting. Yeah. So, I mean, if it's exciting to me, it should be exciting to somebody else. Now, whether <laughs> they like it or not, I, you know, no, I didn't know that. But yeah. I'm just saying, I've I've lived an extraordinary life. Yeah. Not always on top. Mm -hmm. And see, some people think you have to be on top to have a great life. I have a great life, and I'm just doing, living my journey, and it's just going along, and it's just always been, just yeah. you know, sometimes up, not that, but it's still been going on. Yeah. So uh, it's exciting to me. <laughs> In the mid '90s, and I, I don't mean to upset you by bringing it up, but there was a very traumatic experience. You lost your son in a car accident. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how you go on from something like that. There seems to be a pattern within you that you can work through adversity, and I think. At points you've been giving. No, it. I can't work through adversity. I tell you, the thing is, I just keep going. No matter I'm like that. What is that battery? The energizer <laughs> bunny. Um, I know a lot of people say that, but I think that when I say I don't, when I say I wouldn't get upset about you mentioning my son, is that that's part of life and it happens. Yeah. So if we're if we are to let everything that happens, that's you know not really <laughs> the happy moments in our life stop us from living, then we're, I don't think we're doing what we're supposed to do as human beings. I think that as human beings, we have ups and downs, you have all these things go on, and of course you got to feel them. You got it, it has to hurt, right. you know, and sometimes it takes years to, to get over that hurt. Uh, and I certainly have had my share of it, but I don't know, I guess I was given uh, the, the, the sort of knowledge uh, to know how to live life in terms of whatever it is. Yeah. That philosophy, where do you think it comes from for you? Oh, my mom. Your mom? <laughs> my yeah. mom, yeah. My mom yeah, is an angel. But I had two moms. I had an uh, aunt who was my, who raised me until I was nine. And then I had my own mom, biological mom. And uh, they both contributed to who I am. But I think my, my heart and soul is definitely my biological mom. But my style and beauty and all those kind of things is from my other mom, my, yeah. uh, my, uh, aunt who raised me so I got something from both of them but my mother my real mother was an angel yeah. and so I had the, the 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 wonderful experience of being brought up by a human being who couldn't read nor write but boy was she just clear yeah you know you didn't get any distortion there and so you're able to see the real things in life. I think a lot of times with children, what's going on today is that, you know, as, uh, sometimes the parents are not able to give the children what they need because they got to work, they got to do this, and you know, it's, it's so much going on. Yeah. And it's hard for children to see the truth through all of this stuff. Right. And besides you being a piece of musical history and having contributed to a piece <laughs> of musical history, you actually have possession of an amazing collection of history of music. The Supreme's clothes, mm -hmm. those costumes, those dresses, those gowns. How did that come to be in your possession and, and how do you use them now? <laughs> it was just by luck. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny when you tell the story and I've heard it before. It's by luck. Well, you know, if you, if, you, if you were in the group and you left, you had to leave your gowns. Right because the group was going on and that's how I ended up with them because I was there from they the kept beginning leaving, you stay. <laughs> and I stay so I got something out of it uh, I, I still get royalties too but so that's how I ended up with all the with most the majority of the gowns uh, yeah. because the ladies you know they left for one reason or other or were put out for one reason or another and the gowns stayed yeah and mm -hmm. so now you tour them actually they go out and yeah they, they're, they're them, touring it and one of the biggest things that was so great was um, uh, we opened at the Victoria and Albert's Museum in London, and mm -hmm. it, everybody was there. We had all kind of great. <laughs> Bill Wyman of the Rolling Stones was there, which I'm going on tour with. Him. I was just going to mention that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to. He loves me, uh, <laughs> and so uh, he was there, and we had all kind of 
other groups, popular groups in England who were, who were mm -hmm. there, who all came out, and it was a great event. And then it toured uh, in, London, in England for about, I think it was two years. Yeah. Just great. And I couldn't let you leave today without mentioning the fact that actually you were part of opening the Astrodome right here in Houston, the yeah, eighth with, wonder with, of the with, world. Yeah, with Judy Garland, was it? Yeah, with Judy Garland. I'm looking for posters. You know where I can find a poster of that? I don't, but we'll, we'll try and find you <sighs> yeah, one. Yeah, I've, I've been, because that was one of my favorite things. But before we leave, I do have to tell you, I do have a new CD. Right, and I was going to say it's also, latest CD. you it's have not gone quiet by any means. I know, but <laughs> see, the pro I know, right? Uh, <laughs> but the thing about it is, is that, you know, there's not a lot of radio now to yeah. play new unless you're a rapper or whatever, and I'm not a rapper. Although I did Davy, Davy Crockett, King of the Wild. I rapped on that back <laughs> in the 60s. I did. <laughs> I should pull that out. Anyway, so, yeah, so, but there are two singles on the CD that have been released. Uh, Life's Been Good to Me, and it's a, a Mother's Day song called uh, Darling Mother, and I dedicated it to my mom, Johnny May. Oh, that is mm -hmm. fabulous. Well, thank you for all of the joy, all of the excitement, the music, the love that you've shared with us all these years. It's an honor to sit down and chat with you. Thank you. Thank Such you. Such a pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Mary Wilson. Hey. Stop. <laughs> <laughs>